A few months ago, over the course of a few very very boring afternoons, you decide to pass the time by forging new identities for yourself and for your companions. As a novelty, you give yourself the title of Baron. You select a very small, isolated and far off place within the kingdom you are in. The chances of somebody knowing who actually rules that land are slim to none. So, the chances of you being exposed and inconvenienced drop significantly. Two of your companions are part of your household. Perhaps distant cousins or something. One of your companions, as far as you remember, was your personal advisor. While the other was, if your memory serves you right, the head priestess of the local temple. Fair enough. Wherever you go, you tend to slowly but surely drop the name, drop the title, just to obtain a few more discounts, just to make people more talkative and perhaps get you that uh, cleaner room in the local inn. You did the same in the city you are in right now. Slowly but surely, rumors started circulating that a baron from a far off part of the kingdom is visiting. You got invited to a few dinners. You got invited to a few afternoon teas with the upper crust. But a few days ago, being of noble birth, you received official invitations to a feast organized in the honor of the king's own advisor visiting the county. This is a tremendous opportunity to mingle with high society. At first you're not that sure if you should go or not, not wanting to expose yourselves. But then you hear that the mark you've been after, the individual you've been chasing all this time, might make an appearance at the feast tomorrow night. This could be a very good opportunity of taking care of your issues once and for all, or at least get close enough to that monster and find what weaknesses they have. See how they are. See who they talk to, who they mingle with. See if there is any way of taking them out without jeopardizing yourselves. Let's get ready for a feast. Hello everyone and welcome to Funky Monkey MP, the place where you get your weekly dose of miniature painting, history and world building. On today's episode we will be talking about feasts and table manners during the medieval ages in Europe mostly. This is going to be part 1 of 2 as there are many rules and expectations set for medieval feasting. As such, I want to cover them all and give you just the right amount of information so we can have fun and you can use it in your fantasy settings, whatever those may be. Before we start our discussion, let us talk about the miniature. This is a shark miniature from WizKids and as you can see it is quite impressive. We're gonna have a lot of fun with this miniature today. And with that out of the way, let us begin. First, we need to start with a disclaimer. The etiquette, all the rules or the expectations were set in place because at one point in history, somebody went and fudged things up for everyone else during feasts. As such, we will be talking about some of the more interesting aspects and some of the more weird aspects that you might encounter during a medieval feast. Let's start off by talking about cleanliness. I know that Hollywood often portrays people in medieval times as being dirty, grimy, smelly, but that is far from the truth. People throughout the ages enjoyed cleaning themselves. It's a 
process that helps alleviate stress, anxiety, and our monkey brains tells us to clean ourselves because if we smell, we can attract predators or we can scare away prey. As such, we are programmed to clean ourselves. Of course, that is not universal. It wasn't in ancient times, it wasn't in medieval times, and as sure as heck isn't in modern times. But the vast part of the population did clean themselves. And of course, it was expected for wealthy people to be cleaner than the commoners. With that, the first part of attending a feast was going to the venue. Once at the venue, you would be greeted by servants before the doors that set up a small area where basins filled with scented waters would be set up and your hands would be thoroughly cleaned by said servants. After this process was done, another servant would dry your hands on a clean towel. Once this was done, you would be invited in the great hall. You would pass through the doors and then present yourself to the host at the high table. Usually the high table would be empty because the host and the guests of honor would arrive fashionably late. You would then be taken to your seat. Before we continue with what happens once you are seated, let us take a peek at the miniature, see how it's coming along. While I'm waiting for paint to dry, I am working on the fin. Once the shark is fully dried, I am going back to Dawnstone after diluting it with a generous amount of water. I'm trying to apply it in an even coat and not mess up the paint job, but well, I couldn't, especially on the nose, as you can see. But it's not a big problem, we'll repair it. Once you are seated, a clean towel would be placed over your right shoulder or your left shoulder, depending on the period of time we are talking about and depending the culture or the preferences. Once seated, you would also notice something peculiar. There were no forks. Forks have a very strange and interesting history and we're gonna dive into it just a little bit. The oldest forks uncovered by archaeologists date from 2000 BCE and were found in Asia, in China if I'm not mistaken. It takes 2000 years for them to be more commonly used within the Roman Empire during cooking and serving. And then it takes four more centuries until the fourth century when within the Eastern Roman Empire, later known as the Byzantine Empire, forks become a little bit more common among the nobility. In the 10th century, so almost six centuries after, 600 years, a German chronic talks about a Byzantine princess that marries within a German noble family and talks about her table manners when she's eating with forks instead of her hand. This for them is astonishing and it is considered to be vain. In the 14th century, 400 years later, forks become more and more common within the Italian peninsula. Now there is an interesting theory that's running wild over the internet and I don't know if I agree with it if, or if I completely disagree with it. It's, it's very strange. The theory goes that people started using forks more oftenly within the Italian peninsula because pasta started playing a more important role in their diets and it was easier to eat pasta with a fork rather than a spoon or your hands. I don't know if I agree with that, but I, I genuinely can't disagree with that. I, I couldn't confirm this theory. I will research and perhaps come back to you at one point, but it's... I kind of like it, but it's so weird that it might actually be true. I don't know. I don't know what to say about this one. Okay, so in the 14th century Italy and then in the 16th century, so 200 years later, forks become a staple among the nobility and the merchants. So it has a very strange and interesting history. 
But enough about forks, let's talk about spoons. If you were quite wealthy, you would have your own custom-made spoon that you would bring with you. It was a way of showing off. And everybody was expected to bring their own small knife or a small dagger to eat with. This was another opportunity to show off custom-made daggers of precious metals encrusted masterpieces of their time. Kings and queens would have eating daggers encrusted with all kinds of precious gems and inlaid with ivory and rare woods and it was crazy and very interesting and a strange way to flex. But who are we to judge? Before we continue, let's take a short moment and appreciate this wonderful miniature and then we'll continue. Earlier I applied the coat of Nuln oil to the anterior side of the shark. Now that that is dry, I am dry brushing on a layer of white scar, insisting on the areas where the two colors of the shark transition from one onto the other, and especially around its nose and its mouth, trying to give the skin a little bit more texture and a smoother transition between the two colors. Another thing you would notice while attending a medieval feast would be the lack of glassware. Glass was quite expensive and quite hard to produce and um, mold into different shapes and as such only the wealthiest of the wealthy would be able to afford glassware. Clear glass was actually more expensive than colored glass because colored glass could hide a few imperfections while clear glass, well, you could see everything clearly. Now, when I say that only the wealthiest of the wealthy would afford such a thing, and I'm talking about kings and queens and heads of church and only the most wealthy individuals and the most powerful. Now, next time you want to feel like medieval nobility, make sure you adopt a powerful stance and grab your nearest IKEA glass as it tremendously helps and feel good about yourself. You are as strong and as wealthy as a medieval king or queen. Congratulations. Now, Usually, tableware would be made out of fine pottery, with the exception of the plates themselves. If you wanted to show off your charity and your benevolence, and if you want to earn the love and support of the general population, you would use trenchers. A trencher is a very low quality unleavened bread that you would bake using the poorest quality ingredients. Then you would leave it out for a day or two to harden up a little bit and then you would slice it in two. Each piece would then be used as a plate. This allowed for all the juices, all the gravy, all the aromas and all the different bits and pieces of food placed on top of it to be soaked in a little bit. Once you were done eating, you would give these trenchers soaked with all the good bits, with all the juices and gravies, to the poor of the city. This was called giving alms to the poor. Not arms, if they were given arms, I think our whole history will be dramatically different. But giving alms to the poor. Now, if the plebs, if the poor stepped on your nerves and got on your bedside because let's say they wanted more rights or they wanted more food or they wanted less taxes, you would take these trenchers and instead of giving them to the poor, you would feed them to the animals that were running around your household. Even soups and stews were served in bread bowls that were later either given to the poor or fed to the animals. Now, I don't know where you guys come from, but where I come from, only the most expensive restaurants serve soup or stews in bread bowls and they are so overpriced and the quantity of soup inside is quite small and you wouldn't eat the bread bowl. 
if you were to eat your trencher, you would be considered a very rude simpleton and would probably never be invited back if you manage to stay until the end of the feast and not get thrown out. If you're wondering what else people ate during feasts, make sure you check out my previous videos right over there that talk about what people ate in medieval times. And I just want to go back to the uh, towel thing one last time, but before I do so, let's take one more look at the miniature before we continue. I'm going back over the bleeding wounds of the shark with another coat of blood for the blood god, making them more visible, making them seem a little bit deeper. Checking on all sides, making sure that I haven't missed any of the wounds. Once I'm happy with the results, I'm going back to the pink haru and Dushapti bone mixture working on the shark's mouth. Welcome back. I want to talk about the towel over the shoulder during feasts. This was placed here so that the individual could wipe their hand after eating. This is used only for the right hand because the right hand is the only one that gets dirty while eating. If you're wondering why, well, I'll tell you. The left hand was used to hold food while you were cutting it. The left hand in medieval times, as it happened in ancient times, is considered to be impure, to be unclean, to be evil. This is a very old concept, deeply ingrained in human mentality across the world, and it has its roots in old religions. But not only. Another reason that the left hand is considered to be like this is because the vast majority of the human population is right-handed, and as such, the people who are left-handed are considered to be an abnormality. The left hand is considered to be good only for holding things down, for wiping your bottom after relieving yourself, and as such it is considered very vulgar and very rude and appalling to use your left hand while eating. If you were seen during a feast using your left hand to grab food and put it in your mouth, you would be considered a very vulgar, very ill-mannered simpleton and you would most likely be never invited back if you weren't thrown out before that. People were very, very intolerant of this kind of thing. It is very sad, in my opinion, that this rule has an impact on today's societies across the world. Multiple cultures still consider the left hand as being evil, unclean and only good for wiping or for helping in menial tasks. For example, my mother was forced to become ambidextrous because she is a lefty. And during kindergarten, primary school, general school and up until she graduated from high school, she was forced to use her right hand, otherwise she would be punished, her grades would be uh, lowered, just because she was using her left hand, even to this day. Her handwriting is quite pretty while using her left hand and almost intelligible when using her right hand. In my opinion, it is high time we get rid of this misconception or preconception that the left hand is somehow evil. Now, let's change the subject and finish on a high note. When it comes to entertainment, during feasts you would have exotic dancers, you would have troubadours, you would have bards, if you were up north you would have skulls, you would have fire eaters, you would have jugglers, you would have jesters, and even the occasional poet if you were quite fancy, or if there was one around. But another form of entertainment, especially here in Europe, were morality plays. Morality plays are basically plays with a very, very strong and very in-your-face religious theme. I don't know if these plays were all that entertaining or all that appreciated, but given the important role that religion played in medieval 
life, I think they were quite appreciated. But even if they weren't, after a few drinks, I think it didn't really matter. And with that, we're done with today's episode. If you reached this far, please make sure you hit that like button as it helps this channel out. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for the privilege of your time. I truly hope you found some inspiration today or at least learned something new. And I can't wait to see you all next week here on Funky Monkey MP. Have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day. Cheers.